Hell. That's today's subject. Hell. Hell. Fire and brimstone. Not just any old hell, but the hell of the Bible. The hell that the Bible talks about, describes, and gives a count of who's there and who's going to be there. Uh, and what's there. It's a place that you do not want to go. You say, well, you're just trying to scare us. Absolutely I am. The Bible and God warns you. God warns you about it. Hey, listen, if God warns you, you better take heed. Forget what I say. My opinion and my thoughts aren't important, but what the Bible says, that means everything because this is the mind, heart, and soul of God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. My name is Brother Mike Sadler. Today we're going to dive into the Bible and talk about hell. Who's in hell? What's going to be in hell? How long will hell last? Um, and all kind of good things. So, one thing I want to make aware to you though is how many times is hell mentioned in the Bible, the King James Bible, that is. Well, in the Old Testament it's mentioned 31 times. And in the New Testament it's mentioned 23 times. Now, if you look in the New King James, it's only mentioned 13 times in the New Testament. The NIV, 13 times. The American Standard, 13. Why is it less, just about half of the amount of the original King James Bible? Well, if you sugarcoat hell, it don't sound quite as bad. If you say, you know, when the world says you're going to, they don't say you're going to Hades or you're going to Sheol or you're going to the lake. No, what do they say? Hell. Why? Because even a non-believer knows that hell is not a good place. It is not a place you want to be there. You know, the word hell in our English language has power. It strikes fear into people. Nobody wants to go to hell. Nobody does. So if you start removing it and watering down God's word, it doesn't sound so bad. Or if you just completely take it out, as quite a few versions have done. And as it goes on, it only get worse. Why? What, what does one book that, hate and sat that, that Satan hates? And that is the Word of God. And that's the King James Bible. He hates that book. You can bet your bottom dollar. He, know he, he knows he can't get rid of it. So what does he try to do? What does Satan always try to do? He's a counterfeit. And he will try to counterfeit it right to deceive many to deceive many so be aware of that so why do they start to remove the word hell out of those bibles well because in our english speaking language the word hell has a lot of power it has a lot of power you know one preacher said the people who try to air condition hell are the very ones going to hell themselves <sighs> i'm not saying that's a completely true statement but it sure makes you think don't it the ones that try to air condition hell are the very ones headed there. Oh, wow. That's tough. That's a tough saying. But the Bible says it's true. You know who preached more about hell than any other person? Jesus. You know, the loving Jesus that would never offend anybody that the world thinks about. He would never say nothing wrong, never hurt nobody's feelings, always be politically correct. He's the one that preached more about hell than anybody else in the Bible. Jesus. You know, the first thing that John the Baptist preached when he came was repent. Matthew 3, 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. The very first thing. Now notice this. The very first thing that Jesus preached was repent in Matthew 4, 17. For the time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is is at hand. Both of them, John the Baptist and then Jesus Himself, the first thing they preached was repent. What is the first thing you're supposed to do when you witness the people? Tell them to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Either you're going to hell or you're going to heaven. Now you're not going to you're not going to persuade them or just make up their mind for them. They're either going to believe it or they won't. Okay? Now, but you are supposed to tell them and what they do with that information, the truth, the gospel is up to them. Because there, there's three things you can do with Jesus. You can call him a, a liar, a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And that's who he is. He's my Lord, my Savior. That's Jesus Christ. Amen. And I thank God that I'm on my way to heaven. Heaven bound with the hammer down. Amen. 
So the Bible even tells us who we should fear in Luke chapter 12, verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, he's talking to us as he was talking to the disciples in, but this is to you if you're born again, if you've been converted. My friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. There's nothing more that they can do. Verse 5 says, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Now this is Jesus Christ warning you who you should fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now the Jesus that, that the world knows that would never hurt nobody's feelings, never step on nobody's toes, never never hurt your, uh, never go against what you say because I don't want to hurt your feelings. Here he tells you, hey, you better fear God because he has the power to cast you into hell. So you say today you're talking about hell to try to scare us? Absolutely, if you're not saved, you better be afraid, and we'll find out why. The worldwide uh, proclamation of Christian message, you know, all those disciples were, were persecuted and unto death, you know. Not Judas, he, he betrayed Jesus, but the other 11 were murdered, martyred for their faith, killed for preaching about Jesus Christ. Peter, I believe, was crucified upside down. They killed him, they murdered him, and you can expect the same today the Bible says that men love darkness and hate the light. And if you're saved and born again, you have the light of Jesus Christ inside you. And they're going to hate that. They're going to hate that truth because that light shining on their dark heart, they will attack you. You can bet your bottom dollar on it because they don't like it because the Bible says that their deeds are evil. And so, you know, physical death was a limit that they can hurt you. Just like he said, physical death was a limit. So this, we should not fear. Yeah, you might be a little afraid. They might cut my head off, but that's all they can do. That's, that's as far as they can take it. That's all they can do is kill you. But the Bible says you better fear him that has the power to cast you into hell. And it, listen, the ones that don't get saved, that persecute you, they'll wind up in hell. And that there's nothing that can come close, any type of punishment or you know eternal damnation in hell that can even come close. The Bible says you're supposed to love your enemies. You're supposed to love your enemies. Pray for them that persecute you, for great is your reward in heaven. And praise God for that. And so the disciples were to fear God rather than man, and you and I, the ones that are saved, are to do the same thing. Is hell eternal? Absolutely. Hell is eternal. You'll be cast into the lake of fire. And in the end, it says death, hell, and the grave will be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. So the doctrine of annihilation where you don't really burn forever, you just burn up and then you're gone. No, sir, no, ma'am. The Bible says it is an eternal place, an eternal state where a person will eternally burn forever in hell. Why? For the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is hell. That's why Jesus came to die on that cross, to pay that penalty if you'll but accept it. So let's talk about the torments in hell. Matthew 13, 50 says, And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, is there different types of torment in hell? Do you think there's different types of torment? What does the Bible say about that? Absolutely there's different types of torment. Uh, look in your Bible in Mark chapter 9, verse 48. Mark chapter 9, verse 48. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Where the worms eaten you alive, and the fire is never quenched. That's just, that's hard to imagine being like that. If you've ever had a burn, it's horrific. It'll burn all that night, all the next day. It may burn and feel hot for days. Could you imagine being in the lake of fire? Nobody wants to go to hell. Even the ones that joke about it don't want to go to hell. But the world is so blind. The world is so blind. The God of this world, that's who Satan is. The God of this world has the people so blind that they even make up songs about it. ACDC, on, my, on the highway to hell, they sing about. And they sing about hell's bells. They really don't understand. And they really don't believe. And they really don't fear God. Or they wouldn't be doing that. I promise you that. Hey, listen, there'll be no party in hell. There'll be no bells in hell. And the highway to hell, the Bible says, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, but straight and narrow. Straight and narrow is the gate that leads to salvation, to life. Why? Because there's only one way. And that way is Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ. When Thomas said, I don't know, Thomas the disciple said, I don't know where, we don't know where you're going or how to get there. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the only way. There's no church that can save. There's no preacher that can save. There's no pastor that can save. There's nothing else that can save except Jesus Christ. You can't save yourself. So the Lord separately speaks of hell as a place where the worm dies not and the fire is not quench. That's tremendously solemn. If you really believe it, hey, we would not be just living for the, the frivolous things of life. No, we'd be out winning souls. Lord, oh Lord, give me a passion for souls. Give me a passion for souls. Now, if you look in your Bible in Revelations 14.10, the Bible says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. That's just the first part of the verse, and we're going to stop there. But the wrath of God. Can you imagine? Now let me give you a, just a tiny, tiny fraction of a glimpse of what that would be like, what the feeling would be like, or to stand before God if you're unsaved. If you've ever had a lightning strike next to you, or if you've ever been in the midst of a horrific hurricane, or if you've ever been in a tornado, or a really, really, really bad earthquake. And all of a sudden, you get the feeling of how small, tiny, insignificant, and powerless you really are. That's just a fraction of what it would be like to stand before God and give an account for your sins if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's just a fraction of what it would be if the, if the wrath of God was poured out upon you. That is a scary thought if you're unsaved. If you're unsaved, you say, you're just trying to scare us. Absolutely. What did Jesus do? He warned you. You should fear who you should fear. So was Jesus trying to scare you? Absolutely. Absolutely. He was warning you. This is who you should fear. So who was hell made for? Hell was made for the devil and his angels. It wasn't actually made for any person. God didn't want anyone to go there. Or he wouldn't have sent his only begotten son to die on that cross. He sure wouldn't. He wants everyone to be saved. 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All of us. What I say, John the Baptist preached? Repentance. What did Jesus preach first? Repentance. What did that verse just say? That all should come to repentance. I want you to repent. So, Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and the everlasting fire prepared for who? The devil and his angels. That's who it was made for. For the devil and his angels. He didn't want any of us to go there. No, he put his son on the cross to pay for the sin. But you will go there if you reject that gift. If you say, oh, it's not that bad. I'm a pretty good person, you know. I mean, I'm not like that guy. I never did that. I never murdered anybody or, or raped anybody. I never did that. I'm not like them. Well, you can always find somebody that's worse. But they're not the standard that God's going to judge you by. Here's the standard. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, the Bible said. And that is Jesus Christ. Revelations 20 and verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. What did it just say? Deceive them. He's the great deceiver and he's very good at it. He's not the one the angel is going to show up or the uh, devil is going to show up in a red suit and a pitchfork and a tail. Oh no. He comes as an angel of light. Yea, hath God said? That's the first thing he said. And it put doubt it put doubt, it put doubt, it put doubt in the mind of the people. What is he going to do to you? He's going to put some doubt there. Ah, it's really not that bad. Oh, God might just say, come on in. Oh, no. No, sir, no, ma'am. God said, I'll, I'm going to tell you, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And he's talking about people, he says, that cast out demons and devils and done many great works. He's going to say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And iniquity is wickedness. It's wickedness. Why? Because there's none good. That's what Jesus himself said. Why is thou call me good? There's none good except the Father in heaven. And so the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone with a beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
There is no doctrine of annihilation where you burn for a little while and then it's over. What did that verse just say? Forever and ever. It's eternal. It, once you once your person is cast into the lake of fire, hell, they're not coming out. It's forever and ever and ever. There is no doctrine of annihilation. I know that's a great thought, and you think, well, I can't imagine God would let somebody burn for all eternity for forever never ending, and they never get out. He never gives them a break. He just gave you His Word, what He's going to do. He just said forever and ever. And I would take God at His Word because He literally means what He literally said. That's what I love about the King James Bible. It's a good translation. It's a good translation. It's, it's, it's the word-for-word word translation. See, it's not the thought-for-thought. Thought. I don't want a word that, where I think this is what God said. No, I want my Bible to say, this is what God said. Amen? So, in Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil himself is cast in the lake of fire to join the beast and the false prophets. Now, if there is different levels of heaven, Lord help somebody who's a false prophet, who gets on TV for money, or... Maybe even a pastor of a church who is really doing it for the money who's not saved or using God's name for something for money's sake. The Bible says false prophets. Can you imagine they'll be on the level with Satan himself? Lord have mercy. If there are different levels to hell, I'm not saying there is, but I'm saying that it says that the false prophets will be there with them. My goodness. I pray that they repent that they fear God and they get saved. So it may seem surprising that Satan would be able to assemble an army of unbelievers at the end of the uh, millennium, because that's what this verse is talking about, the millennium. However, it should be remembered that all children born during Christ's reigns will be born in sin. That's right, and they will need to be saved, the Bible says. Not all will accept Him as rightful king. They just won't. You would think that they would, but just like today, they just won't. No matter what, if the truth's right here, here it is in black and white, see? No, I'm just not going to accept that. I'm just, now nah, this is what I think. Man, it doesn't matter what I think or you think. It matters what God said. That's what matters. So hell will punish those who reject Jesus Christ. It gives us the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all the things that offend of them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be a whole lot of screaming, crying, and a gnashing of teeth. Why? Because it's a bad place. Now this is the verse that really just blows my mind in a way. I mean, I understand it, but I guarantee you I don't understand it fully, okay? Isaiah chapter 5, verse 14. Therefore, hell hath enlarged itself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth it shall descend into it. Does that just say hell's growing? Hell can get bigger? Hell's, that means it'll never, you can't fill it up. It can hold as many as God deems it to hold. That's right. That the, Bible, the Bible says hell hath enlarged herself. And uh, like we said, the world today, you know, they think of, oh, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus would never say that. He would never offend anybody. Or if you're witnessing to somebody, it may be another Christian that says, you know, you're just being unloving the way that you're doing that. Tell them they're going to go to hell if they reject Jesus Christ. You know, why, how, just, you know, that's just not the right way to go about it. You should be their friend first, and then, and then friendship evangelism, and then win them over. Well, my friend, that's not in the Bible. The Bible says go out and preach the gospel. That's what it says. And so the Jesus that the world has that never offend anybody, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's a Jesus they made up. Because Jesus said things like this in Matthew 23, 33, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Boy, if that don't get you right to the point, buddy, nothing does. So the whole fact that Jesus wouldn't offend, he wouldn't approach it like that. Really? Because he told him, you're a bunch of snakes and vipers, and you're on your way to hell. How can you escape it? That's what he said. So where is hell? Well, there's not a verse in the Bible that specifically says, hell is in the center of the earth. There's not a specific verse that says that. I came up with this. For one, you can talk to a lost person. Instinctively, everybody knows inside of them, Nobody wants to go down. Everybody wants to go up. Something inside you kind of tells you, hey, hell's down and hell's up, right? So 
where is hell? In Matthew 12, verse 40, the Bible says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, you think about all the volcanoes that are out there in the world, liquid hot red magma coming out of the earth. Isn't that strange? Because there's nothing but dirt. There's nothing but dirt. And there's water, rivers under the ground, but yet there's also red hot lava coming out everywhere. And I know scientists have said that uh, now they've figured out that there, there is a core within the core of the earth and it's over 2000 degrees. And so there's a core, but then there's an actual center center core that's just molten iron, nickel, metal twirling around in a circle. How they figure this out, I don't know. Whether it's an exact fact, I don't know. But is there something blazing, blistering hot in the earth? You betcha, because it's spewing it out at every volcano that there is. So there's something there. What exactly it is, we may not know the exact details till later in life, right? But we do know that there is a hell and that it's not a place you want to go. The Bible says there'll be gnashing of teeth, gnawing of tongues with a worm, never dieth, and the fire's never quenched. That's not a place you want to go, my friend. In Revelations 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus died, descended into the earth three days and three nights, as did Jonah in the belly of the whale. Because that's what that was a picture of. And then the Bible says when he came up, he will live forevermore and he has the keys of to death, hell, and the grave. That's right. Jesus has it. That's why you can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And you say, well, exactly how will I do that? Well, remember what John the Baptist and Jesus first preached? Repent. Repent is you basically asking forgiveness of your sins to God. Forgive me of my sins. You realize you're a sinner? You say, I haven't done nothing that bad. Have you lied once? Have you stolen one thing irrelevant of its value? Have you ever looked at another person that wasn't your spouse with the lust? The Bible calls that sin. And it says if you've, you're, you're guilty of one point, you're guilty of them all. The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. Not one. Not one of us is good enough to make it to heaven. And I know this is a lot of people do this, but I'm a good person and my good will outweigh my bad. Well, try that in a court of law today. If you murder somebody and you say, yeah, but your honor, I gave you know $2 billion to the Red Cross and, and fed homeless, that's not gonna matter. What's gonna matter is your sin, your crime. And that's what you're gonna be, what? You're gonna be found guilty on that. Your good works are gonna be irrelevant. It will be the same when you stand before God. It will be the same. There's no scale that weighs your good and your bad. When you're guilty, you're guilty. And so repentance is you realizing that I really am guilty. And I, Lord, I am sorry. And I truly mean that. And then you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ because you know that you can't save yourself. There's no church that saves. There's no preacher that saves. There's no building that saves. There's nothing else that saves. You can't save yourself. The only thing that saves is Jesus Christ. And so after you repent and you realize that, hey, I've, God, I really am and truly sorry for these sins. And you turn from them. You ask God, you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you. And you say, well, exactly how do I do that? Well, if you were dying, if you were drowning in the ocean and you were bobbing up and down and you came up for your last breath, you knew this was it, you'd never get another breath and you had to cry out one time for help. That's exactly how you've got to come to it in your heart and you cry out to Jesus. You realize I can't save myself, but I know that you can save me. And I put my faith and trust in you. And the moment you do that, God says he'll give you a new nature. That's right. The Holy Spirit will move in and, and you will be saved. Your name will be written down in the Lamb's book of life. And you will have escaped hell and you will have entered into heaven. That's what the Bible says. That's the Bible way. That's the Bible way out of hell. That's what the Bible says about hell. That's not my opinion. Look these verses up for yourself. That's what the Bible says about hell. And you say, well, you're just trying to scare us. Absolutely. That's what Jesus was trying to do. He was warning you. Fear him that hath power to cast you into hell. Not the one that can cut your head off and rip your spine out and stomp you to death. Don't fear him. 
Fear the one that has the power to cast you into hell even after you're dead. That's the one to fear. Amen.